commit me to begin with a note of gratitude for the honor done to me by, uh, by the kind invitation of His Excellency Abdullah bin Barak, President of the Forum for Promoting Peace in Muslim societies and our most gracious host, the government of the UAE, uh, represented by uh, the Minister of Tolerance, who is here, and of course His Highness Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed al -Bank, to speak on the role of religions in promoting tolerance from possibility uh, to necessity. I also must say that the government of the UAE deserves our commendation for designating 2019 the year of tolerance and this forum for taking up the challenge of attempting to forge a consensual ethic for promoting tolerance. The defining paradox of our world today is that thanks to technology and globalization, we have never been more connected than we are today. Yet, at the same time, we have probably never been more divided than we are today. <coughs> this is the handiwork of agents of intolerance who weaponize our fear of the other. In recent years, we have witnessed a rise of religious extremism, right-wing populism, and ultra-nationalism. We have seen extremists hijack the symbols and letters of the faiths and use them to prosecute violent campaigns that violate the sanctity of human life on a global scale. ISIS, Israel, Boko Haram, etc. There is scarcely any region of the world that has not been scarred by the plague of terrorism. And yet, such is the diversity of the composition of our societies that for us to allow the promotion of hatred and strife between our communities is to permit the destruction and the fragmentation of our communities and nations. Therefore, if we are to prevent an endless cycle of strife and conflict, Tolerance is a necessity. But whose duty is it? On whom does the responsibility lie to bear the touch of tolerance and to illuminate the new pathways to the shared future? It is my respectful submission that the burden rests squarely on leaders and especially religious and political leaders others that we may describe as the elite in our nation and in our communities. It is our role not only to articulate, as we are doing in this assembly today, the theoretical and doctrinal foundations for a more tolerant world, but more importantly, to make the personal sacrifices that will compel our societies to commit themselves to lifestyles and tolerance. This, if I may say, is the difficult part. This is the difficult part, making the sacrifices. But let us quickly deal with the articulation of the principles that are the foundation of the idea of tolerance. The first principle is to recognize that there is no merit in the notion that the contemporary or this current plague of terrorism and extremism is an inevitable fulfillment of the thesis of the idea, the so-called clash of civilizations. A merely green, in my view, apocalyptic vision of the world's major faith communities locked in perpetual conflict. The great conflict of our time is not between Islam and Christianity, or between Islam and other religions or between extremism and human solidarity, between the forces of hate and intolerance and those of empathy and peace, 
That is the great conflict today. Second is to emphasize the central place of the principles of empathy. This is a thread which runs through all of our moral and religious traditions and is summed up in the golden rule of the words of Jesus Christ, where he said, Do unto others as you have them do unto you. But it goes further. It goes further. Jesus Christ goes further in the Bible to say that we must love our enemies. We must even pray for our enemies. This is the notion of self-sacrifice. In other words, all of this is summed up in the general principle that we must be ready to treat others as we ourselves would like to be treated. And this is embedded in all of the Abrahamic traditions and all of the major religions. It's an expansion of this consciousness that enables us to humanize others regardless of the, of the distinctions that are rooted in class, in ethnicity, in gender, in race or religion. In so doing, we transcend ourselves. The injunctions of the of our of many of our religions that emphasize compassion, mercy, and kindness as the central tenets of religious living are rooted in empathy. Also, the core the core principle, the core values of the major religions validate the notion that tolerance is fundamental to all communal and interpersonal relationships. One of those core principles is recognition of our shared humanity despite our diversity. In Acts chapter 17 verse 26, the Holy Spirit says, and he has made them, he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. The Quran also similarly proclaims human beings who created you all from a male and a female and, and make you into nations and tribes so that you may know one another. These words not only bid us to see our diversity as a blessing of divine providence, but also to impose a responsibility on us to continue to learn as much as we can about each other and to use such knowledge to answer and silence the purveyors of prejudice and bigotry. If extremists practice the demonization of difference, then we must prefer the idealization of diversity as a providential gift. This recognition of our shared humanity is also the basis of the universal human rights. Indeed, as argued by Michael Ignatius, from whose thoughts in human rights as politics and idolatry, I have borrowed liberal in this presentation. And he says, I quote, it is the religious conception of human beings as God's creation that sustains the notion that people should have inviolable, inviolable human rights. Human rights are an affirmation of the sanctity of life. It is precisely because all human beings are sacred in our world that they deserve, that they themselves deserve all of what they get, that they deserve everything that the rights, the universal human rights provides for them. And we must, we must go, and, 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 and this also means that they should be treated, that all human beings should be treated with dignity. Our affirmation or our promotion and our promotion and defense of human rights must also be rooted in empathy. We judge human actions by a simple test for whether we would like to be on the receiving end. Because we feel pain, we can recognize the pain of others and therefore believe that all human beings should be protected from cruelty. 
In other words, the very religious virtue of compassion is the primary inspiration for articulating human rights. We also recognize that respect for human rights is impossible where there is institutionalized prejudice and bigotry. And this prevents people from seeing others as fully human. Under these circumstances, tolerance, peaceful coexistence, and human dignity cannot be realized merely as helpful moral suggestions. Consequently, empathy inspires us to seek justice and to enshrine human rights in constitutional and legal orders so as to protect all of us from arbitrary power. This is what the Prince Worthy work, Initiative, such as the Marrakesh Declaration on the Rights of Minorities in Muslim Majority States, represent. So the path to a more tolerant and peaceful world will be travelled along parallel tracks through the framing of national and international legal instruments that protect human rights, as well as through the work of leaders, peacemakers in civil society, committed to blunting the weapons of bigotry and hatred. The, the, we, we, we can, in any way, minimize the importance of this little object and orders. But this brings me to the second issue. The, 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 the central role of leaders in promoting and establishing tolerance in our societies. Earlier this year, I was privileged to receive Imam Abu Bakr Abdullah, an 83-year-old Muslim cleric who had come to international prominence as a result of an extraordinary event. In June 2018, Christians in the village of Usha Yewo in central Nigeria were attacked by persons who were identified to be Muslims who had attacked other villages and killed several local farmers who were mainly Christians. As Imam Abdullah was finishing his midday prayers, he and his congregation heard gunshots and they went outside to see the men to see that members of the village's Christian community were running away from their lives. Instinctively, the Imam ushered 262 Christians into the mosque and sunk into his home next to the mosque. The Imam then went outside to confront the government. He refused to allow them to enter the mosque, pleading with them to spare the Christians inside the mosque and in his home. When the assailants were adamant, he told them that they would have to kill him first if they were going to kill the Christians. And he had given refuge in the mosque and in his home. They eventually left without killing any of the Christians in the mosque or in his home. Imam Abdullah's selflessness and sacrifice saved the lives of hundreds of people of a faith different from his own. He not only refused to give up the Christians that they had given refuge, he even offered his life in exchange for theirs. His moral, his, his moral courage is rooted in a, in a deeply profound recognition of our common humanity. His compassion, his empathy and selflessness are an example to us as people of faith. Also consider the story of two remarkable religious leaders, Pastor James Moody and Imam Muhammad Ashraf. These two are Nigerians, one a Christian, as we know, and the other a Muslim. As young men in the 1990s, both of them had led rival gangs engaged in violent clashes in the city of Kaduna in northern Nigeria. At the time, they were mortal enemies on opposite sides of a deadly sectarian conflict in which Imam Ashafa lost two brothers and his teacher and Pastor Uwe lost his right hand to a machete attack in 1992. 
both men paid a heavy price for their mutual enmity and their thirst to exact vengeance on each other. However, in the years that followed, a curious thing happened. Through the intervention of mutual friends and a series of separate personal epiphanies and meetings, these two men came to increasingly respect each other and eventually they decided to work together. In 1995, Ashafa and Muye co-founded the Interfaith Mediation Center, a religious grassroots organization that has successfully mediated between Christians and Muslims throughout, the, throughout Nigeria. The organization, which now has over 10,000 members drawn from across the country, over 10,000 members, engages with militias, trans young people, as well as women, religious figures, and tribal leaders to become civic peace activists. Under their leadership, young Muslims and Christians jointly rebuild the mosques and churches that they once destroyed in various parts, in various parts, especially the various parts of the country. These churches that were destroyed and mosques destroyed by sectarian violence. For over 15 years, these two religious leaders, who were once mortal enemies, have now become, have, have now gone practically all over the world, to different parts of the world. And they've traveled here and there, preaching a message of peaceful coexistence. <coughs> Their work has not been easy. Both of them have had to confront pessimism about their endeavors within their own communities and deep doubts about the possibility of peaceful coexistence. But there is no doubt that their efforts are yielding fruit and also that they are contributing to a gradual, to a gradual coming together, a gradual coming together and a psychological disarmament among communities that hitherto have long seen themselves as enemies. Now, this is the very nature of self-sacrifice in bringing about peace. And I'll tell you just one more story. A few months ago, a leader of a major Christian denomination in the northeast of Nigeria sought audience with me. He comes from one of the states that Boko Haram, that the Boko Haram insurgents have attacked to Italy. He said that he would like the governor of his state, a Muslim, to be given a national honor. And I asked why. He said the governor rebuilt over 90 churches that were burnt down by Boko Haram, by the Boko Haram insurgents. A Muslim. The building churches burned down by insurgents is the clearest and most unequivocal way of saying that Islam does not support the destruction of places of worship of other faiths. The government's actions spoke louder and more persuasively than the citation of many scriptures. The stories of Imam Abdullah and of Pastor William and Imam Ashafa and the government that I've just spoken about are significant because in each case the leaders had to make almost suicidal sacrifices. They had to take on popular steps. They had to confront people of their own faith to see the value and worth of people of other faiths and beliefs. They put their credibility and even their lives on the line. It is these types of sacrifices that can root out intolerance and bigotry. No amount of words or platitudes can change the human predisposition to prejudice and parochial. Only acts of deep humility and personal sacrifice can. There is no question at all that this is the responsibility that leadership places upon those of us who are religious leaders, those of us who are political leaders in our countries. The responsibility of leadership is not just words. 
is not just text, it is not just laws. The responsibility of ministry is self sacrifice, is putting our reputations on the line, is putting our words into action. Thank you very much.